Okay. Look at all these microphones. What's up? <laughs> all right. Hey guys, Dr. Baird here. We are live here in Beverly Hills. I have the beautiful city behind me. I'm going to just adjust these cameras just so you guys can see me just a little bit better. And you can see the beautiful city behind us. And then we're going to dive into some cool questions, okay? Um, so booby questions. Yeah. All right. I got a filter on this one. I look kind of dark. Can you change that? Yeah, I shouldn't have. I didn't put any filters on it. Okay. I'm going to show you my new dance moves. <laughs> okay. We're going to do... Wait, wait, no. Floss. Wait, how are we going to do it? I can't do it. Uh, I'm so I'm so off. Oh, you already fought Jessica. I haven't even said anything. You already started following me. So thank you. Um, for you those of you guys joining in, I'm Dr. Barrett. I'm a board certified plastic surgeon right here in Beverly Hills, and I just broke the world record for having the most amount of microphones on me because we're going live on multiple platforms. We have TikTok, we have Instagram. He is filming with the camera. What's up, Zach? Okay, over there. She's with our ecom, and then we got Nuja. What's up? All right. So in case you guys ever wonder like what's happening behind the scenes, that's what's happening behind the scenes. They're all mad at me because I just took the whole platform and it's moved all around. Um, okay, so, all right, so we're gonna get into a little quick long format question, um, some, some common questions, and you guys are interested in breast surgery or any kind of general surgery questions in general, so these might be helpful for you. So, if you are thinking about breast augmentation surgery, I have a couple uh, questions that I get all the time, okay? So, number one, is how long does it take for implants to drop? So as you know from surgery, when you put the implants in, actually I have one right here. Ta-da! If you put an implant in, this is a textural one, we don't use those too often, okay. This is huge, it just gave me a big boob. All right, so uh, if you put an implant in, it starts out really high, and then it takes a little while for a drop down, all right? So that process on average takes about six weeks. Now, some people it's longer. If you're really tight, completely flat chested, it might take up to nine weeks, sometimes up to six months for some people. A lot of my trans breast augmentations, uh, which I'm very well known for doing, can take uh, up to six to nine months for them to kind of drop and settle and get that little characteristic fold. So that's question number one. How long does it take to fully recover from a breast augmentation surgery? So in general, um, most doctors' recoveries are longer than mine. And so I will tell you how long it takes for my patients to recover, okay? Um, so my patients, it takes roughly three days of solid downtime, and they're literally back to work at a desk job at day four. How do you make that happen? Well, there's a lot of surgical techniques that we do, including pre-injection with numbing medicine. We have a lot of uh, special or non-narcotic medications that we actually give at the time of surgery so that you're not like totally zonked out when you wake up. Um, and then we have a lot of post-operative recovery products um, that help with pain control afterwards. Number one is magnesium, okay? So I'll just show you, I'll show you. ta -da! Can you imagine all these little, all these bottles are staying on without falling off. All right, <laughs> that's from our team. So this, this product is called magnesium. Uh, it is uh, a special magnesium. Um, it is called BioOptimers. Bio-Optimizer's Magnesium Breakthrough. You can get it on the website. You can get it on ours, postoprecovery.com. It's the same price you get anywhere else. Um, I'm gonna hand this back to you, John. Yes. So, oh, we dropped the fish oil. So the reason why that's important, it has seven different types of magnesium. Why is magnesium important? For breast augmentation recovery, because that muscle spasm is very uh, painful. It's not so much like the pain of the surgery, it's that tight of the muscle, because remember, that implant is underneath the muscle for most, most augmentations, and especially mine, all right? That stretching sensation causes a lot of pain, so that magnesium actually relaxes the muscle, and then it does two other very important things. It prevents constipation, which happens with nar if you're taking narcotics, which most of my patients don't take narcotics, and two, it helps you sleep at night, right? So a lot of people will take a narco to help them sleep at night. Don't do that. Narcotics don't give you good sleep, and they interfere with a lot of things, uh, including your wound healing, and your appetite, and your bowel movements, right? It paralyzes your bowel, so you want to stay away from any narcotic pain medication. So that's why magnesium is like a triple breakthrough for, for this recovery period. The other thing I recommend is CBD. Um, and I, I, I love CBD so much that I actually developed my own CBD. Uh, it's super concentrated. It's about 1,500 milligrams. Whoop! There we go. And, um, oh cool, we got the bottom open right here because it was stuck. Anyway, 
So basically, it's this. Uh, you take a dropper, you put it underneath your tongue, and you do it when you get, I tell my patients to a full dropper when you get home and a full dropper right before you go to sleep. And that CBD works on two receptors that we know of, um, CB1 receptors and CB2 receptors. Um, CB1 receptors controls anxiety, so this is great to take before surgery, and then CB2 receptors are your pain receptors. And it's not, no, I'm just kidding, I don't know. All right, so I just, that's why pharmaceutical companies don't like it, because they can't get you addicted to it. But, um, you know, I take this every night before I go to sleep, it increases you. If you ever track your sleep like I do with an aura ring, it's gonna boost your, boost your deep sleep at nighttime, okay? So, Barrett Recovery CBD at postoprecovery.com. Okay, you can check this out and buy it. If you're planning on getting surgery, not by me. I won't be offended, but you can still at least get my CBD. Um, it also has special terpenes that I added into it that are anti-inflammatory and great for post-surgical healing. There you go. All right, so um, that is key in terms of recovery. I have my patients do a lot of movement right afterwards, not upper body. So like full recovery, like being able to do heavy lifting with your upper body takes that six weeks. Um, I have my patients starting... Um, I have my patients starting exercise at two weeks, walking around right away, because movement helps you heal. Being in bed puts you closer to the grave. Always remember that, okay? So our bodies, humans are meant to move. We are hardwired. We're not chimps or chimpanzees. We're not apes, which are hardwired to sit still and be sedentary. Humans evolve to move, always. Your hormones, everything in your body is designed to move, and you're healing, especially with your lymphatic flow, okay? So um, you always wanna be moving. <clears throat> um, you'll live longer and you'll recover from surgery faster. Um, and then roughly right around six months, things are pretty much mature, settled down. So like the little twinges and little feelings and stuff like that will go away. But it's not like you need six months to recover. It's just like, okay, when are things like fully, fully, fully back to normal? All right. Um, how do you minimize the scarring? That's another common question I get. Well, it starts... It starts preoperatively by optimizing your health and nutrition, lowering the inflammation in your body. Why is that important? Because if you have high levels of inflammation, um, in your body, then uh, can we turn the air on? Sorry, yeah, um, yeah. If you have high levels of inflammation in your body, you are more likely to upregulate the fibroblasts in your body. Okay, and uh, your your set point for when you develop a hypertrophic scar lowers. Okay, so it's like imagine. You know, somebody, you poke the skin like one or two or three times, four times, and all of a sudden it starts to form a hypertrophic scar, right? Some other person might take seven or eight times. The person that takes seven or eight times is someone who has lower inflammation in their body or low genetic predisposition, okay? So uh, that's more, that's just a simplification of, of, of this process. But what you want to try to do is keep that hypertrophic response. You want to prevent the trauma to that area and the inflammation set point lower than that person's uh, set point for when it gets hypertrophic. Okay, so that that starts with really having lower inflammation in, in your body prior to surgery, being healthy, and um, and then it comes to surgery. So surgery is a big portion of it. Using scalpel versus cautery. Cautery, you know, on the skin causes thermal injury, so we want to avoid that. Um, a very sharp scalpel to cut the skin, and then meticulously handling the tissue underneath the skin, not handling the skin itself, um, is is absolutely crucial. Okay, so. That surgical technique is, is, is very important. And then closure is very important too. Like you wanna reapproximate. like the breast has five layers. So think of like five layer lasagna or five layer cheese dip. Um, and by the way, guys, I'm gonna to get to all your questions at the end of this, so just keep hanging in there, okay? So if you bring all those layers back together very precisely with individual sutures, the deep three, we use absorbable sutures. The top two, we use non-absorbable sutures so that we remove at week one and week two, you get much less space gap between these layers, okay? So that uh, your body has to put out less scar tissue so that it, you, it heals nicer. And then we tape the incision. Um, it's kind of like a cast, right? So like if you were to break your arm in an accident, you would, uh, you would put it in cast for six weeks at least, right? So the same thing we do for the skin. We tape, we put a special glue and we put tape on top of it so we prevent the little micro movements in the skin so that it has uh, has a bit, an ability to heal. It doesn't have to keep producing all the sticky stuff to, 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 to bridge that gap. Can we just check that one more time, please? Um, let's see. Can we turn that on and then lower the temperature? Yeah, thanks. Oh, uh, okay, got it. Um, great. So, and then lastly, we have a scar management protocol. Afterwards, we recommend a product called Skinuva. It's not my product, um, and I'll go ahead and show this to you guys. Also, you can find it on my website, postoprecovery.com. This is it. 
If you have any and all scars, this is the best scar management. Uh, and you put this on the incision twice a day. Um, and it has fetal growth factors in it, which I think are fantastic. It has, also has some lightening agents in it. They have another version of it that's called Scanuva Bright. That's also really good as well. So, okay. So all those three things. And then uh, awesome, oftentimes we can do some microneedling or laser on the scars to make them blend away as well. Let's see, do we have any water? I'm gonna yeah. some water, thanks. <clears throat> so breast augmentation before and after swelling. So yes, there's a lot of swelling that happens with breast augmentation. It takes a little while for them to, that swelling to go down. And then it also takes a while for the, the breast to kind of drop and fluff is what we call it. So the, um, that, that fluffing is when the skin has a chance to kind of relax and develop into breasts. All right, so that again happens six to nine weeks up to six months for some people. How to sleep after surgery? I get this question a lot. Um, first few nights, I would say up to three, we want to sleep with the back elevated. And then after that, start to lay flat. Whatever you need to do to get your sleep the most is, is the most important thing to you. Your sleep is the most important thing for you after any surgery. Um, so whatever it takes for you to get the best sleep, but if you can sleep with your back elevated for the first three nights um, But if it's causing you not to be able to sleep then screw it. Just figure out a way to get your sleep um, where um, When can I wear a normal bra after breast surgery? Uh, I tell people wait two weeks uh, check with your doctor every surgeon is different because <clears throat> I like free range, I have a free range mentality for your breasts. <clears throat> if you wear a very constrictive surgical bra, a lot of the, a lot of the leading um, plastic surgeons now, we're getting, away from, uh, we're getting away from wearing really tight surgical bras after surgery because it's kind of constricting the breasts and not allowing good blood flow, all right? So don't be surprised if your surgeon says, no, we don't need a surgical bra afterwards. I get a lot of patients that ask me, they're like, hey, my doctor, uh, suggests that I, I wear a surgical bra, uh, or my friend says I should wear a surgical bra. I was like, that's your friend, I'm your doctor, trust me, this is, I've done thousands of breast augmentations. Patients heal faster when we don't put them in a, in a surgical bra afterwards. Now, there's certain situations that I do use surgical bra, and that's if I'm doing a pocket repair, or there's a pocket slipping that's happening from the primary augmentation. So, great, cool, awesome. I got my moonshine, I'm ready to go, you guys. <laughs> On Wednesday. Mm. Okay, so, and I got a mini fan. <laughs> it's like hot under this light. Um, okay, so, um, but you can wear any kind of bra after two weeks. So some people say, I just, I still want to wear like a, a loose fitting sports bra. Um, and I'm like, fine, as long as it's loose fitting, it's not really constricting. What you'll see sometimes in when you have breast augmentation surgery is it'll be really swollen here, and then that swelling will kind of go down into the hips. And that's normal. If you guys want to see a really detailed video about my post-operative instructions, check out my YouTube, Dr. Barrett Plastic Surgery YouTube, and check out post-operative instructions, and then check out breast augmentation. I kind of go over everything there. Um, but um, that's just for my patients, okay? So if you go to a different doctor, make sure you follow your doctor, all right? When can I get back to work after surgery? Now, that depends on what kind of work you do. But for most people at a desk job, I say day four, you can go back to work. Use your judgment, you know, whatever you think. If you have a, if you, if you have a really intense, a stressful kind of job, maybe you need to take a full week off. Um, and if you're doing any heavy lifting, that's a manual requirement. You're going to need a note. We provide notes for nurses and stuff like that um, that says, you know, there's no heavy lifting for the first six weeks. Okay, and that's important because I've had patients at week four lift up a, a gas handle pump and cause a hematoma and cause bleeding in their breasts. I've had patients that have dug post holes at week two in their backyard get a hematoma. I've had people do handstands right here on Rodeo Drive day one after surgery and get hematoma. So um, hematoma is bleeding, and that's if the muscle starts to tear and bleed inside, and so that's why you want to kind of limit your, your, uh, your heavy lifting. Breast reduction is not the same, folks. This is more for breast implants because we're underneath the muscle. Breast reduction is much more uh, quicker recovery in some ways. All right, <clears throat> can I breastfeed my child before and after surgery? Um, well, you know, you are the decider if you need to breastfeed your child before surgery. Okay, but after surgery, breast implants statistically have been shown to reduce your ability to breastfeed by about 7 to 10%. Now, that depends on the study that you look at, uh, but the, the evidence out there, no matter what kind of incision you use, can reduce your ability to breastfeed by 7 to 10%. And that's important. If breastfeeding is the most important thing to you in the world, 
don't do breast augmentation surgery. Don't do any surgery on your breasts. Um, maybe wait until you're done breastfeeding. Okay, but if you're willing to weigh the pros and cons of being able to breastfeed versus having amazing, great looking breasts, then you have to kind of decide that, um, that risk of not being able to breastfeed. Breastfeeding is very important. I highly recommend to do it and try it. Um, but even women who have never had implants have a hard time breastfeeding. So I like to think that my surgery is kind of special in a way that I don't really violate that pyramidal structure of the ducts. Okay, so I go upwards towards like the, the well, now think about it. The, the, the glandular tissue goes upwards towards the nipple. And as long as you're not severing the, the top of that pyramid, where it connects to the nipple, you shouldn't really interfere with the ability to breastfeed. But the studies show t seven to ten percent. I don't have the studies on my patients, but I'd like to think that I avoid all that the way I do my surgery, and I've had plenty of patients go on to breastfeed after my surgeries, and I haven't had anybody say that they haven't been able to. So, um, do your own research on that. Okay. How long does it take for breast implants to settle in? We talked about that, guys. It takes about six six to nine weeks and really full recovery is about six months, but you're gonna look good next day, all right? Um, I do tell people they look like aliens, but you're gonna notice a difference. They're gonna, they're, you're gonna be happy. Um, some people will wrap you up so you might not be able to see it right away, but if you really want them to kind of like, all right, where, my, where is like a good point where I expect them to be decent? It's about six weeks. And best type of breast implants, this is a tough one. Um, I have a whole video dedicated on this, like saline versus silicone. I like, uh, I like silicone implants, smooth round silicone implants. I don't like shaped implants. I have one here. Okay, this is a shaped implant. The reason why I don't, because it can rotate sometimes and it can look funny. Um, I like round implants because no matter which way it goes, it always looks the same. And if you put it underneath the muscle, you get more of a teardrop shape, okay? So, um, and then also they have textured implants, but this texture has been associated with a rare lymphoma and one in 52,000 cases. So I generally don't try to use textured unless I have a difficult case. And of course I tell the patient about that risk, that possibility, okay? Coming up that I might need to do that. She had uh, her implants drop down too low and putting in textured and we'll be able to, we'll do a pocket repair, put a textured in and a hold it all together. And she's okay with that risk. So we talked about that. Um, okay. so. If you're thinking about breast augmentation, um, you want to come see me, you can check out my website, drdanielbarrett.com. I have a virtual consultation page where you can fill out your information, submit a photo, um, and I can get back to you. Like, all right, this, this would be great, or no, this is not a good thing. Um, almost always is a good thing. And uh, we can get you connected. If you're getting breast augmentation by somebody else and you're looking for some guidance, you can check out my YouTube. I talk a lot about things that you should ask for for your plastic surgeon, um, and you, know, you want to make sure it's a good fit, um, questions you should be asking. And then in terms of recovery, I, I actually, I get so many people that have surgery elsewhere, they always ask me recovery questions and what kind of products and stuff like that, including my own patients. Uh, I, I developed my own recovery website. It's called postoprecovery.com. So postoprecovery.com. Um, I'll, you know, we'll, we'll kind of tag that in here. And then um, I have a whole kit. You can just like, boom, check breast augmentation and it's got all these products. Let me go over them one more time with you guys. So here you go. All right, and uh, so we've got the Scanuva Scar Gel, Magnesium Breakthrough. We've got our Heal Fast, that's a, multi, that's a multivitamin we recommend. And Jean just put the CBD up there. We've got the fish oil. Taking fish oil after breast augmentation will reduce your risk of capsule contracture by 10%. If you guys don't know what capsule contracture is, look it up, check out my website, check out my YouTube. It's very important uh, for you to understand that that's the number one complication for breast augmentation surgery. Nationwide, it's one in 20 women will get it. My rate's about one in 100, it's down probably around one in 200 now since I started my patients taking fish oil, all right? Um, and it's not crappy fish oil, you wanna like, I like this product as Living Fuel Mega Essentials because it's high quality fish oil and it's not oxidized, it's not rancid, all that other stuff. I also recommend Arnica, I think I have this backwards guys, sort of. Yeah, I'll show you the other side over here. I've got Arnica, which is good, boom, it's falling off. I got the Scanuva Scar Gel. And then I have this whole big, like, recovery kit in here has all the gauze. It's like, if I already get a breast augmentation surgery, what kind of stuff would I want? It's got like band-aids, basin, tape. It's like the ultimate first aid kit. Like, you know those little dinky, crappy first aid kits you get on Amazon? It's like, I just bought a bunch of crap put in a bag, right? It is like the best band-aids. It is the best thermometer that you can get. So um, it even has a little antibiotic ointment in there for you. So I put all that together, I was like, and it's like, this would cost you like 500 bucks if you were to try to go to a drugstore to try to get it. And it's all in there. If you're having any kind of surgery, like have this kit, or if you just want a nice first aid kit at home, 
get this. Now, this thing kicks ass. Um, I don't think we make any money on it, but it's maybe a little bit. But um, it, it's it's primarily uh, just like doctor. What a doctor would want. What a what a. I guess a, a fancy doctor would want because that's me. So I'm, I'm very particular about a lot of stuff, a little OCD. So um, okay, so we'll dive into some questions that you guys have. And um, is 375 the average implant? User 586. Nine four eight three eight six eight two two eight. No, typically I'm on smaller size. I'm typically three twenty five is my most common. Um, okay, let's get get to your questions, guys. I'm trying to understand when would be considered a good time for me after hormone therapy. I would wait two weeks. Take your hormone replacement therapy, uh, but then stop at least two weeks prior to your surgery, and then two weeks afterwards because that puts you at high risk for blood clots. Okay, uh, hormone hormone replacement can cause um, uh, cause problems with blood clots, guys. So be, make sure you talk to your doctor about that, okay? All right, so let's get into some of your other questions. Is implants the only subject here? For right now, it is, but um, you could you could fire it up. I've got a couple here. Okay, Kaylee Costanza, do you help gauge what size someone should do? Yes, I do. It's, a, it's kind of a group process. What you don't want is to go to somebody that's one size fits all. Um, I get a lot of women who come and see me and who say that um, they woke up and their breasts were way bigger than they wanted to be. And to me, that's a huge failure on the part of the surgeon because one of my hardest things to do is to try to get the right size for my patient. So part of that is, is trying to get it out of my patients and I try to get it in the same wavelength. It's like, what do you want for your body? Because I will always keep people natural, okay? There are some surgeons that will go really big and really unnatural. That's just not me, I'm not gonna do that. I like to keep people within the normal, natural confines of the body. Now, within those natural brackets, I call them, parentheses, whatever you want to call it, there's like small, medium, large. And then that's where I have, like, I go over photos with my patients. And then ultimately, I do on-table sizing. So I'll take, uh, uh, like, all right, we see 300 cc's is, is what I think is going to work. We'll put a 300 cc sizer in. We'll sit you up. We'll see how that looks compared to your desired goal photo. So if you have, like, Emily Ratajkowski as a desired goal photo, we'll put in the, we'll put in the implant. We'll sit you up. We'll see how it looks. And we'll be like, all right. Does this match the photo over here? Um, and then if it does, it will go up, or if it does, and if it's too big, it will go down, right? And so it's important that your surgeon does that. Ask them, do they do on-table sizing? Because as good as I am, the thousands of implants that I've done, um, I've never just been one, one shot, I know what I'm doing. I always wanna see exactly how. It's just like trying on shoes at a shoe store. You try on the shoes, make sure it fits. Okay, got another question here. Um, how soon after breast augmentation can you travel by plane? I have some people that travel the next day, but the important thing is don't have it over a carry-on bag, okay? If you put a carry-on bag, um, that means you have to lift it and put it in the overhead compartment. So uh, I always say just check a bag um, or don't even take a bag, just ship it. Uh, have someone else do it for you or have someone else carry it for you because you don't, I had patients that, a patient that came from New York, got a breast augmentation, put the bag in the overhead compartment, felt it happen, had to fly to New York, and then fly right back. So I had to drain the hematoma. It was pretty painful. Um, so, but you can fly the next day. The important thing is to get aisle seat and walk around every 15 minutes, okay? Because that helps prevent blood clots. You're at higher risk on a plane and having surgery to uh, get a blood clot. Can augmentation affect nipple sensation? Uh, can breast augmentation affect nipple sensation? Yes, it can. The rate is pretty low. And it also, it depends a lot on the surgeon and it depends on the size that you go. If you go very big that distorts your anatomy, you're going to stretch the nerves out and you might sever them. Also, if the surgeon doesn't know what he's doing and he's dissecting laterally, your nerves come from the back, they come around the side, and then they come up through the serratus muscle right here laterally. That's where the majority of your nerve, your nipple sensation comes from. And I protect that when I do my operation. So my loss of nipple sensation is very, very low. It's not zero. I have some patients that have lost nipple sensation. So if nipple sensation is the most important thing to you in the world, don't do any breast surgery, okay? Because there's always a chance that you could lose that. Um, but again, it's always the pros and cons. So typically after breast augmentation surgery, I get hypersensitivity. So patients get very sensitive and it comes back down to normal right around six months. Okay, this question is from Tilda V. May. How soon after surgery can you start using CBD drops? Immediately. In fact, maybe we should even do it right before surgery because CBD will help you with anxiety, help you just drift off into anesthesia, not being anxious. I don't do any Valium. I don't do any benzos. I don't do any of that crap because it's just addicting and it's all pushed by the pharmaceutical companies. Like, oh, I gotta have my Ativan. I gotta have my Ativan. Well, you're just making your, your anxiety worse. You take your Ativan, you feel better, and then you feel worse when it goes away. 
Ativan worse, Ativan worse, Ativan worse, and then pretty soon you can't exist without it, uh, which is Christina R80. Can a fat transfer to the breast along with a lift be better than implants with a lift? That depends on your anatomy, right? So a lot of people ask about fat transfer. Um, it's something I do quite often. Um, sometimes I do it in conjunction with an implant. So we do liposuction, abdomen, flank, so we do fat transfer to the breast. Typically, you can get about a half cup size improvement of the breast reliably. If you're looking for something more than a half cup size, any shaping characteristics, like your breasts are kind of funny shape or the asymmetrical, implants definitely are the way to go. I tell people that like your results with an implant is typically eight or nine out of 10. Um, your results with fat transfer is around six or seven out of 10, okay? So if you're looking for the best, best looking breasts, implants the way to go. But if you don't wanna you know, sign up for implants, then you can totally do fat transfer if you have enough fat and you only wanna go half cup size approved, okay? Um, so we have another question. This question is from Roslyn, my wife, what time for dinner? And it's probably gonna be 6.30. <laughs> because I got, I got 100 emails I haven't even touched, and the air conditioner is not working in the operating room, so I gotta go down and fix it with the AC guy who's down there fixing it, so <laughs> I'm working on that. All right, Flebedin, wait, Flebedin, Flebedin. Can I do breast fat transfer months after I got my implants? Sure, you can totally do that. You just gotta be careful, you gotta have a good surgeon who knows how to do fat transfer and to stay out of the implant. You don't wanna poke the implant and rupture it if you're doing fat transfer, right? So you wanna stay on top of that plane. Um, it's something that I do quite often, especially in patients with pectus excavatum. Do you guys know what pectus excavatum is? Someone who has a concave chest. Uh, sometimes I'll do fat transfer there, and I've completely corrected it in many, many cases uh, with fat transfer, which is pretty awesome. Or if you just have a bony chest and you want to put some fat in there, you know, that, that will also help. All right, so we have a couple more questions from you guys. Um, let's see. Some doctors, okay, the same from Tilda. Some doctors say not to wear any kind of bra for six weeks after surgery. Um, that's fine. Just follow your doctor's recommendation. Um, I think that two weeks is probably fine. It's kind of hard to go without a bra if you're used to wearing a bra. Okay. And then J JDBs. Okay. JDBZ. Is there a way to have implants placed closer together to provide more cleavage? Yes. This is something, an advanced move from a doctor who does a lot of breast augmentation. All right. If you elevate the pectoralis muscle, um, Bray, I'll get back to you really quick. If you elevate the pectoralis muscle, you can get much more cleavage. All right. And... Um, but you gotta be really careful you don't pop it open and get synmastia, okay? So that's why I used to do a lot of breast reconstruction. I still do some, and I'm very familiar with that anatomy. So that's, um, if you're looking for more cleavage, you definitely wanna go to somebody who knows how to make those kind of moves happen. All right, Bray, you had a question about is silicone or saline still being used? Um, silicone is, but it's a cohesive gummy bear, all right? So, so for example, this is a silicone implant. If we were to cut this open, the gel doesn't pour out onto the floor. It's a, it's a cohesive gel. It's kind of like if you were to bite the head off a gummy bear and like squeeze it, the gel doesn't like pour out onto the floor, okay? So um, that's why silicone implants are much more safe. Saline is still being used, but I don't think it's any more safe than a silicone implant. Uh, but the problem with the saline implant, it has those ripples on the edge um, that you can see that rippling. If you guys haven't seen my video on saline versus silicone, check it out on my YouTube page. Um, Dr. Barrett, Plastic Surgery YouTube. Also, for you guys on my TikTok, um, I've got a whole bunch of stuff on my Instagram. Dr. Daniel Barrett is my, is my username, um, and I actually get back to a lot of the DMs there. And then you guys on my Instagram, check out my TikTok, Barrett Plastic Surgery, where I, I do a lot of funny stuff, and I actually have a couple, few more videos here and there. All right, let's get a couple more questions from you guys. Uh, Sarah Pardo, can I get breast augmentation if I'm overweight? Yes. Um, you can. Sometimes we have to use a bigger implant, okay? And sometimes we have to use a more projected implant. But if you're p depending on losing, planning on losing the weight, try to lose the weight first. Come in and see me when you're at your goal weight. It's, it's just a little more predictable. Um, okay. We got Cindy01. Who is health-wise not suitable for breast augmentation? Um, you know, somebody, uh, that, that, that's a two-fold question. Obviously, nobody should be having surgery, an elective surgery, if the surgery is going to put them at a, at a dramatically increased risk for their health. Okay, so that's why we, we screen all of our patients for the health. So if you have a heart condition, if you had a heart attack, you know, you're not getting surgery by us. All right, and don't do surgery for, the, for this kind of thing. You need to, you know, last thing you want to do is jeopardize your health for, for cosmetic reasons. Okay, and I know breast surgery, it can be very important for some people. Now, implants and breast implant illness. Okay, some people that are predisposed to autoimmune types of things, I try to get them, um, I try to kind of help them get through some why they're having this autoimmune condition. So things like psoriasis, thyroid disease, ulcerative colitis, 
Crohn's disease, um, diabetes sometimes can be caused by autoimmune, okay? Um, you can also have, um, uh, let's see, lupus, right? If these types of things are happening to you, it's most likely gut derived, okay? So there's a product I recommend, it's called, it's also on my website, Leaky Gut, it's not, it used to be called Leaky Gut Guardian, it's now called um, Biome Breakthrough, okay? And basically it takes two, one scoop in the morning, one scoop at night, it has three different things in it. Uh, first one is uh, probiotic, prebiotic, and the third one is IGY Max. The IGY Max is at the, the, the breakthrough product. I had actually lupus antibodies. I started taking this in and, and I got rid of it um, by healing my gut. In addition to fasting, I fasted for like five days just before Christmas and it just totally reset my whole immune system. It's really tough though. So start out with like a 24 hour fast. Don't try to jump in a five day fast like I did without experience in that. And then um, the last thing was uh, digestive enzymes. That's also on my website. Uh, it's called Masszymes, this is what I recommend. And you take four of those with every meal. Helps decrease the immunogenicity of the food particles that you eat. Um, there's a big, long uh, kind of explanation for why this works. But basically, if you have a leaky gut, it's letting all these food particles into your bloodstream. Your body's producing antibodies to those food particles. It normally wouldn't. Now, that antibody is recognizing that peanut protein of the peanuts that you just ate. But guess what? That antibody is now also recognizing your thyroid. And then boom, now all of a sudden you're attacking your thyroid. So leaky gut syndrome, leaky gut, and poor gut health contributes to a lot of these autoimmune situations. So um, that's why I suggest these products to kind of optimize you. If you're specifically susceptible, um, you'll know if you're ever in one of my consultations, I'll just go on a 30 minute deep dive and it's like I'm an, it's like I'm an alternative medicine doctor. I'm not, I was, I was trained by Western medicine, but you know, some of these things are so important and relative to my patient's health, which we try to address. Um, because the last thing I wanna do is set you up for an autoimmune condition or flare up of, of some problem. And it's, it's funny, actually, I had a patient with rheumatoid arthritis. She's like, doc, my breasts are great. Um, thank you so much. You know, this, is, this was uh, four months later, but she's like, you, cure, you cured my rheumatoid arthritis, right? Now that's, that's your body attacking joints, right? Just, just from the products, the, the, um, the, uh, the products that I was recommending for her, so uh, to optimize her for surgery. Hold on. Um, so the other thing is um, the breast implant illness. We think it's, a, it's because of there's a contamination that can happen around the implant. Your body's like constantly attacking the implant. It's not the implant itself that's actually causing reaction. It can be that capsule formation, that constant bacterial infection that your body can't clear because it's a foreign device. So that's why it's really important you go to the best reputable doctor that you can so that your implants are put in. Uh, perfectly as possible. If you see my videos, you can see how I irrigate, I do all this voodoo, um, all of that. Illness is very rare, uh, and if it does happen, we just take out the implants. So, pros and cons, okay? Uh, last question from YouTube. from YouTube. For men who have had bilateral mastectomy due to cancer, um, what's better, implants or fat grafting? What will restore the look of a male chest? Uh, that depends, it depends on, on if, it's, if it's both sides, uh, implant might be the best way to go, um, but fat transfer can also work as well. But if you don't have much tissue there to, to graft to, an implant might have to be the best bet. All right, guys. So uh, again, I'm going to sign off here, but I just want to let you guys know a little call to action. Um, if you want to have more information, uh, please check out my YouTube, Dr. Barrett, Plastic Surgery YouTube. Virtual consultation on my website, drdanielbarrett.com. If you're interested in getting surgery from me, that would be awesome. I'd love to meet you. Um, drdanielbarrett.com. We do do virtual consultations, or you can come in the office and see all the fun stuff we do. Um, I just, I just I, it's funny, I'll do TikToks with my patients if you're ever interested in that. But um, fill out that virtual consultation page. We'll get back to you. Um, and if you're going to get surgery by another doctor, that's fine. I won't be too upset. But Check out my post-op recovery page, okay, postoprecovery.com, and you can at least get some cool products that will help you recover like a champ, and so you can heal, uh, at least get some benefit from all the research that I've done. Thank you, guys. You guys have a wonderful Wednesday.